This is the Open University. Good afternoon and welcome to the Open University, the most um, carefully dressed university in the entire world, where I want to talk to you today about clothes, about matters sartorial, about taste. Uh, we've touched on these topics before in these broadcasts. Um, people sometimes, I'm sure they're asking themselves, why does Momus just uh, put all these selfies on his um, Tumblr page these days? Uh, and I do think it's important to show, uh, to show oneself. Um, maybe I don't have time to write the essays I used to, and maybe I just do them as videos now. But also, in between the videos, and in the videos themselves, I like to, to dress up a little bit. Um, as I do in my daily life, this is not essentially very different from how I dress on the street. I might turn it down a little bit. Um, <laughs> I was buying a sweater in a shop in Edinburgh the other day. And they gave me this pink bag, and I said to them, if I get beaten up on the street for wearing this pink bag, you know, I'm going to hold you to blame. And we all laughed about that. But there is still this, uh, we've touched also on toxic masculinity recently, and how, you know, it is a bit of a statement to dress flamboyantly, to wear women's clothes, or to wear clothes from a different era. Um, so it's a huge topic, and I find it endlessly fascinating. Um, it's been addressed by famous people. This, I find this book very interesting. It's called The Sociology of Taste by Yuka Gronau, and it's published by Routledge. Uh, and Yuka quotes Quentin Bell's classic study uh, on human finery. Just, uh, and Quentin Bell says that in any stratified society, you're almost certain to have a classification of dress, the upper ranks being, of course, more sumptuous than the hoi polloi. In both cases, you have a situation in which it's possible for the lower strata to compete with the higher strata to challenge the situation of its social superiors by adopting that form of dress which, in principle, was reserved for its betters, and in this situation, you fashion, fashion as a verb, uh, in the sense of incessant fluctuations, perpetually striving after improvement. Um, that I find unsatisfactory and a little bit self-contradictory, because um, how could you be challenging an aristocracy you were actually aping? And also it, it sort of implies a very static model, that there is sumptuousness, finery, which is a kind of constant idea that eventually dem democracy will hoist the hoi polloi up towards so that we will all live like kings. Meanwhile, presumably the kings start living differently, or uh, really what that does is introduce a whole new series of paradoxes about how differences have been erased between the higher and lower classes, or seem to have been, but in fact they've just been pushed into the details. Um, and you do get to some extent, you get a lot of this... Uh, happening with brands like Chanel going down market and being, you know, seeing stickers on the side of cars saying Chanel or, or on jeans saying Chanel, whatever, and everything to be doing. Every, all the, the differentiation shrinking into micro differences, um, micro details, rather. But um, I find much more uh, convincing the Georg Simmel approach. Simmel was a German sociologist who wrote a lot about fashion and taste. Um, drawing, I, th I think, on Kant, Immanuel Kant, Kant said we couldn't escape fashion, um, but that it wasn't that important. But it's an illusion to think you could step outside it entirely. So he, he believed in, I guess, a kind of half-hearted following of fashion. Um, but Simmel said um, uh, that taste and fashion are in a perpetual state of coming into being and dying. <clears throat> so it never actually exists. To be in fashion is constantly transformed into being out of fashion. There's a tendency towards universalism inherent in every fashion, but this tendency can never be fully realized. As soon as fashion permeates everything, it stops being fashion. Quote from Simmel. Um, as soon as the example has been universally adopted, this is an essay he published in about, about 100 years ago. Um, as soon as the example has been universally adopted, that is, as soon as anything that was originally done by only a few has really come to be practiced by all, um, we no longer speak of fashion. As fashion spreads, it gradually goes to its doom. Fashion includes a particular, a peculiar attraction of limitation, the attraction of simultaneous beginning and end. And this is something I uh, developed in an essay of mine, which appeared in 2014 in um, the Italian art magazine called Moose. Uh, I wrote an essay called The Knot Spot, which has actually just been republished in an anthology of Moose 
articles they've just put out. Um, I'm not sure whether Moose is going to stick around or not, but it's, I'm happy that this particular essay is the one that they liked of mine. So my, my thing is called The Knot Spot, and the, the, the theme of it is that in order to create the new and the hot, um, the art world produces alienation, occluding and sublimating its own recent past. This creates a knot spot, a place where junk and treasures sit side by side. Tastemakers and curators are powerless, and relativism undermines all values. Yet this pathetic scrap heap is also the place where the future is most likely to come, looking for inspiration. So in a, in a sense, if you think about it, think, some things being in fashion creates a whole lot of things simultaneously which are out of fashion, including the, the things which were previously in fashion. Uh, so I, I got very interested in this knot spot, a kind of Beckettian non-fashion, which is actually an essential part of the fashion machine, the fashion process. Just as you could say, you know, um, an underclass is an essential part of the aristocracy, you know, feudal at feudal model. You need the peasants to make the aristocrats possible and vice versa. It's a kind of um, simultaneous um, symbiosis. So... I spoke about being in a second-hand store and finding an old catalogue from Documenta 6, which took place in 1977. And I found it beautiful, um, with a, an elegant late 70s colour, sort of Art Deco cover. Um, and um, so I pulled out the volumes, and I, rec I, I was interested to know which of the, the names of the artists they were referencing from that Documenta were familiar. There were people like Christo, Ed Ruscha, Bruce Nauman, um, and there were lots of others which I didn't recognise, you know, the artists who history have, has not been so kind to. So that gave me a mixed feeling of pleasure and anxiety. Um, I could see the lineaments of the art world I know today, um, a world whose values I kind of share, uh, but uh, this was at a different point in its evolution. I could also see a slightly troubling parallel art world, a place of alien conceptions, ugly shapes, alarming possibilities, defunct thoughts and cul-de-sacs. Scary because you realise that that's also how the future may well look at the values you hold in the present. Um, <clears throat> so I found that that was possibly troubling because maybe it was a better world as well. It was more human, humane, um, more utopian, uh, cooler, less influenced by the super-rich and the neoliberal uh, inequalities which um, mark today today's art world. So if originally means... If originality means anything, and presumably in the art world it does mean something, then new conceptions of art will constantly be emerging which make the old ones look alien, wrong, and disturbing. Contemporary art uh, is the production of alienation. And I must say, <clears throat> I, as, as someone in, with my own fashion sense, I, which is it's obviously influenced by some things, um, but I'm also interested in producing alienation Differentiation, first of all. I guess we have to differentiate between differentiation and alienation. Differentiation is what Pierre Bourdieu was describing in his classic um, landmark study, uh, Distinction, which is the, one of the great books about taste. And he, but he's essentially looking at quite a different society. He's looking at French society post-war, say the 40s, 50s, 60s, where there is a very uh, a stable hierarchy of tastes. And he, would, he will talk about how workers, if they have a picture on the wall, it'll be of Notre Dame Cathedral or a sad clown or something like that. People from that social class, whereas a higher social class will have, you know, an abstract painting or a Giacometti uh, print or something like that, you know, and, and so on. So he, he delineates really the kind of, and, you know, the, the workers will listen to pop music and middle class, the bourgeois will listen to classical music, this kind of thing. There was still, I guess, before postmodernism came along and said, we're collapsing high and low values, there was a much more identifiable, just as it was much easier to say who was, who were the straights and who were the, the hip, you know, in the 60s. It was, there were still people who had certain slick back short hairstyles uh, and other people who were growing their hair and you know it was it was remarkably easy to see w what was progressive and what was retrogressive or backward so um that that while it's a classic study and i would recommend anyone to read pierre bourdieu's distinction it's a fascinating read um and and, and it does still have lessons for us today because I think people do still there are there obviously the, the the marketers in britain for instance are still talking about abc ones CDEs and you know all these these class categories they have, and there are correlations with with the taste. Nevertheless, at the same time, it's it's kind of much more subtle, and um, 
it might be that, for instance, ABC ones are listening to Azalea Banks in uh, <laughs> in a slightly different way than the CDEs. You know, whatever. It might be that they're all paying attention to the same celebrity culture or the same American films, but with a slightly different. With one of them's more ironic than the other, or it has a more intelligent take on it than the other, or thinks it's more campy and kitsch, whatever. Um, <clears throat> so, I had an interesting experience when I was in Scotland. Um, I decided to buy a cashmere sweater. Um, since you know half the shops in Edinburgh, which used to be you know nice old indie record stores or something, are now. Um, by the way, are my pants on fire? I should be standing in a place where my pants are on fire. <laughs> They're now selling tourist gifts to the influx of Chinese tourists to the extent that you will even find cashmere shops on the high street, the Royal Mile in Edinburgh, which are staffed by Chinese-speaking staff, Chinese girls who, who can speak to the Chinese tourists directly about the cashmere they're selling. I have a, a, a yellow, a gold, a sort of mustard-coloured cashmere sweater, which I really like, which my mother gave me. I guess it dates from, the, from about 1970. And it has the colours of 1970. Mustard was one of the colours of that year. Um, and I was saying to my mother, I want to replace this sweater because it's getting little holes in it now. Um, but nobody sells that colour of or, or that grade of cashmere anymore. It's quite a heavy and very soft cashmere texture. So I ran, went around all these shops trying to find something like that. Couldn't find anything like it. I found that cashmere sweaters cost like £200 now. And they have this kind of unsatisfying, not very soft texture. It's a bit like the acid was better in the 60s. The cashmere was better in the 60s as well. I also had this conversation with my mother about how I'm sort of obsessed with the year 1970. Um, and, um, or I guess, I guess this is a bit Bowie 72, this kind of pattern. That I, but it's definitely early 70s. And my mother said that she's also obsessed with the year 1946. So, so it's sort of when we're 10 years old, we sort of really glom onto fashion, glom onto the fashions of the time. And um, so a lot of my fashion sense is, is kind of trying to revive 1970, because that's when I was 10. <clears throat> and um, it seems a kinder time, and, and, and the colours were more vibrant. So anyway, I, I, I went around all these shops, and I didn't find any cashmere sweater that I liked, and, or that was even halfway reasonably priced. But then I ended up in... <clears throat> I went to look for a, a shop called Studio One, which was um, had been Edinburgh's first boutique, really, just off Shanwick Place. Uh, it was a basement in that very 60s way. It had spotlights, uh, you know. It was a damp, a damp old basement, but it had these sort of groovily coloured trinkets you could buy, little stickers I put on my guitar, sort of little flower stickers and things like that. And it just seemed to be countercultural in quite an exciting way. And I, I learned that it's, it closed like three years ago. I think it was run by a gay couple, I'm not sure, but they, they sold some of the contents to a shop which is now called Paper Tiger, I think, which is now opened next door. But a few doors down from there, I found this place called Frontiers, which is like a women's clothes shop, selling sweaters uh, and, and all sorts of very nicely coloured, I guess, I guess that you would say they're sort of 1960s colours, the kind of colours that appealed to me. And then finally I could find cashmere um, that I liked. And, and the thing I got... It struck me that it was it, it was a zigzaggy design, uh, like a pink sweater with a with a kind of a kind of Benetton design. I mean, actually, they were selling a sweater very similar to this one, which um, which was a, an early '90s Benetton sweater in a sort of Art Deco style, which I found in Osaka on my fam favorite uh, arcade, which is in Amagasaki, and it's called the Chuo Arcade. And I got this for you know a couple of euros, really, but it's a bit of a collector's item and they had something very similar to this with a very similar motif for you know 200 pounds which was a, um, a London label um, basically copying this um, in Kashmir but the thing I ended up buying and, and giving to my fiance was um, was this other zigzaggy sweater and I said to the people in the shop this is the kind of thing that you kind of hope to find in a second-hand shop but never actually do um, the irony, of course, is that you often go into second-hand shops now and find things um, which look like, I mean, including this, which I got in the, the Berlin, um, the now Köln Flohmarkt. Um, this probably is an H&M sweater, which is trying to look like a second-hand sweater. These, uh, the, the shop Frontiers was selling sweaters that were trying to look like your ideal second-hand shop find, which 
you know, for busy people who don't have the time to actually rummage in um, to be crate diggers and rummage in the charity shops. The other place I always go in Edinburgh is Stockbridge, uh, Rabin Place, which is full of charity shops. There's like 20 charity shops in a row, bang, 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 and the Exwam shop and the, the shelter shop have great books, you know, fantastic book finds, but also the clothes. Um, and of course, there's always the possibility that you're going to get something that looks like a, um, a uh, second-hand sweater that's actually an H&M rip of a second-hand idea. Um, but, but it turned out that the shop Frontiers had been... <laughs> I came back and I told my mother, I found, look, I bought this, this sweater, which uh, I gave to my fiancé. I kind of bought it for me, but I gave it to her in the end because it didn't really work on me. Um, but, um, and therefore, you know, <laughs> luring her into my stylistic web, you know, bringing her into my world of what I think is cool. My mother said, yeah, that's, you know, that's your brother's favorite shop. Him and his wife were there just the last time they were up here buying things. And it's also your sister's favorite shop. So when I went up to my sister's uh, with my fiance wearing the sweater, I said to her, well, where do you think we got this? You know, and it didn't take her very long to, to come up with it. So that kind of, I, I thought I was being so kind of me, so original. And yet I found that my entire family goes there. And in fact, the next day, we went there with my mother and she bought something for herself as well. So although we have these, these many differentiations within the family in our taste, I always think I'm terribly original and different from them. Actually, we all sort of go and shop in the same shop just by accident, just independent, by accident. Independently, we had these, these values. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit also about a video I was watching the other day, which was... Um, a, uh, a series of fashion shows by Henrik Vibskov. And Henrik Vibskov is probably my favorite contemporary designer. Um, I can't afford any of his stuff. I've never, I've never actually bought any of his stuff. But it really strikes me uh, as interesting to watch these fashion shows where he's um, he's got his own, like any fashion designer, he's got his own interests. And it's almost a kind of sci-fi mise-en-scene when he does a fashion show. It looks like... Um, to me, it, it evokes the kind of parallel world that an amazing uh, a film by Cassavetes or Fellini or something, you know, the way they can create a kind of science fiction idea of what life might be like and actually give a, almost a reproachful sense of, you know, why did you, why did you humans in the audience watching, people with your societies and it, those values of whatever they might be, sportswear, Velcro, utility, convenience, dressing down, jeans, uniformity, all the things which we do out there on the street, we do with our daily dress. Why don't you just think a little bit more broadly or, you know, why don't you do something more fantastical? Why can't you have the kind of society I'm showing in this catwalk? So I find Vibskov's catwalk shows amazing because they, they suggest a a beautiful and interesting world. It's not dominated by, you know, snobbism in an immediately obvious sense anyway. Um, it's not dominated by, uh, I mean, it's multiracial. It, it kind of it mixes in ancient Roman togas with Japanese influences, with Scandinavian influences. And you get a sense of a Scandinavia, Scandinavian liberalism coming through it. Um, you also get a sense of Heian elegance and, you know, uh, that sort of Kyoto courtly style of the Heian, I'm sure that's influenced him. I remember going to his shop in, in Copenhagen and seeing piles of uh, street and fruits magazines, so he's really interested in Japanese street fashion. Uh, and he himself, you know, wears the kind of sweaters. I guess it could also, also be a kind of post-Protestant style. Uh, I'm often harping on about North European Cal post-Calvinist and Calvinist cultures, post-materialist, you know, cultures being a, that being a style band in itself that I'm part of uh, uh, as a Scot. I don't think we have any good Scottish designers like Henrik Vibskov, you know, we, we're not like Denmark, we're not as advanced. We, we do our kind of Harris Tweeds and things and then we do a kind of hip-hop bag based on Harris Tweed and that's our idea of being advanced. But we don't really have, to our shame, I have to say, we don't have a, a Vibskov in Scotland. There are things, some things I dislike in his um, his catwalk show, which is the models have this glazed kind of snobbish look, like the, as if they're walking over homeless people. I always think, first of all, these clothes are really expensive, and therefore they can only appeal to quite snobby and rich people. But secondly, the the, the glazed expression of the models, you know, the way they kind of look 
there's a fuck you kind of attitude they seem to always have in fashion shows. I don't know why. I could imagine a, a parallel kind of fashion show in which those were smiling people that would actually engage with the audience and look them in the eye and smile at them instead of just like, fuck you, you know, this arrogance which always has to be connoted. I don't really understand why you can't be looking great and looking like you're ready to engage with people around you and, and the world. But I suppose, I suppose fashion does always play to some kind of sense of a, a me which is more which is so amazingly superior that it doesn't even dare it doesn't even look back at me the me that I am now I want to be that person who's so impervious so much cooler than everybody else that they just disdain they completely disdain you of course I've I have the, my own masochistic um, mechanisms which uh, which that appeals to um, that I I've been in love with people who disdained me. Of course I have. Um, unrequited love is a fantastic feeling, actually, in, in a lot of ways, and I, I, I believe in it. You know, I, I love the, the sense of not quite being à la, à la hauteur uh, and not being quite at the level of the people who, who dress well or whatever. Now, though, um, if I had to define my own style, you know, it is, it's a series of, of fuck you gestures to certain people and ideas, you know, sometimes I think it's saying fuck you to my family ideas, but actually, you know, when we all shop at the same shop, you know, how can it be? But uh, my mother actually, my mother likes the top half of how I dress normally, but she doesn't like the bottom half, she doesn't like these baggy trousers. And in a way that's, um, that's quite important to me, that at least half of me is being subversive. I'm subversive from the waist down. These trousers I bought in Molenbeek, which is the uh, immigrant, the, the toughest most Muslim area in the whole of Europe, essentially. Um, I think it's a fantastic place, um, and I deliberately went there to buy some baggy Islamic-type pants, harem pants, or sar saruel, as they're called in Japan. Um, I love these baggy shapes, um, and um, it is a gesture of solidarity with an idea of Europe which includes Muslim populations. And it is because that is the ghetto, in a sense, and the ghetto is always, a, you know, a, a certain liberal, radical chic idea of fashion is always drawing on the power of the ghetto. So I'm, I'm definitely doing that, interested in doing that. Um, but also, fuck, I hope this is still recording. Yeah, it is. Um, I've mixed that with these spats, which are actually from a Japanese work work where they're actually worn um, by, I guess, you know, carpenters, plumbers, or people scaling lamp posts to fix the electric lines. You know, to keep their trouser cuffs from flapping dangerously in in the way of voltages and currents and things. And then on top, you know, I've got my second hand thing from the the Berlin gentrification market. Um, I've got my katate, which is, a, a, again, sort of a Japanese old lady wear uh, for exactly this kind of cold temperature. It's actually minus four or something out there today. So this is um, this will keep you uh, warm. And I've got a Korean sweater, etc., etc. So it kind of reflects it reflects the way I shop, the way, the way I'm always looking for bright colors and... Um, interesting shapes, my idea of what's an interesting shape. Obviously this, this trouser style is something endorsed by David Bowie at the, the absolute apex of his influence on me, which was his stage tour in 1978. Hence the, the Bowie gesture I started with, you know. He was um, doing a kind of Errol Flynn thing. I've been thinking recently about Bowie, Bowie's um, reversion to Hollywood ideas, to, to a certain kind of 1940s dress style. He, he would wear high-waisted uh, pleated pants and um, big 1940s collars, but also he'd slick his hair back and keep it quite short in, in a way that was very much against the grain of the, the bands wearing their flares and their denims with their long, straggly, flea-ridden hair in the 70s. He, Bowie really um, defined himself against those people from about 75 onwards with a kind of idea of black aspirational style from the Young Americans album onwards. The idea of the gouster who who had the long chain, you know, the sort of dandy chain down here, but also wore a kind of a lot of Brooks Brothers and really mainstream clothes, but recontextualized them. Bowie lived pretty much from the Brooks Brothers catalogue uh, in those mid-70s times, and some of his sartorial choices are a bit strange, you know, this sort of speckled blue sweater he had, which he wore with braces and these very high waistband trousers. Um, 
it's fascinating to me that he actually wanted Norman Rockwell to do the illustration that would be the cover of Young Americans. That, the most conservative 1940s sort of American idea, that would have been fascinating. In the, in the end, Rockwell's schedule was too busy and they couldn't actually afford to wait for him to, to ready a, an image. But uh, I would love to have seen what Norman Rockwell would have done for Young Americans. <sighs> One of the great lost opp opportunities. But uh, I can totally understand that desire too to go back to quite conservative values and then to do something, to skew them in some way, like to look like an extraterrestrial dressed in a Brooks Brothers suit or to look as thin as he did then um, and, um, and to also take from black culture. So I'm taking really from Asian workwear and from the European Muslim underclass and from <laughs> thrifting second-hand culture. What I find, though, is that... <clears throat> A lot of very high-end designers are kind of inspired by a lot of those same things, or the high-end court culture, the dandyism of, of, of certain Japanese uh, courtly aesthetic, uh, kabuki theatre. Or I'm watching a lot of, um, I, I project a lot of um, sumo wrestling, because <clears throat> I watch NHK Live, you can stream NHK World. And a lot of that is sumo, and instead of watching the actual wrestlers with their enormous... Um, billowing flesh um, <laughs> juggernauting into each other what I watch is the referee because the referee is dressed in <clears throat> the most amazing clothes, the most um, uh, sort of outlandish clothes. I don't mind being just a clown I don't mind being laughed at on the street um, by people who don't pick up the semiology of what I'm doing visually I'm actually quite happy to have improved their day and made them feel better about themselves, as long as it's not actual physical violence. I was beaten up once I think I'll end on this note uh, for wearing um, velvet flares, which I'd bought in Venice. With my family had come back from Greece in the car via Venice. My brother and, and I both were given these velvet flares, which you couldn't have got anywhere in Britain, and they really stood out. And um, my brother, when he went to boarding school, he was wearing them once on a day out up at Hill Head, and he got th kicked in a ditch, thrown in a ditch by some bullies. And I reproach myself to this day for not really having helped him. But I guess there was karma of some sort because I was wearing those same trousers in Dedham. We lived in Dedham in Essex at the time. <clears throat> and some Essex lads stopped me and my friend John Thompson on our bikes and started giving me a hard time about wearing these velvet flares. <sighs> Talk about value for money. Wow, they really, <laughs> they really provoked. They stopped traffic, unfortunately, in the wrong way. These little, I mean, we were 12 at the time, these little boys said, those are poofy pants, aren't they? It was, you know, it was about toxic masculinity and about whether you were a homosexual. And I said, I was trying to be relativistic, and I said, well, if you like to think of them that way, well, that's your right. You know, <laughs> I was trying to defuse the situation with diplomacy, but it wasn't working. So the boys had come with us, and they took us to this leafy little lane off the main road and started just bashing us around the heads and things for wearing these pants. So I have paid the price, you know. I have lived it on the street, man, and been beaten up for wearing the wrong kind of trousers. That was the 70s, maybe it would be less likely now, certainly less likely in a big city than a small village like, a small town like Dedham. Um, but I have paid in blood. <laughs> I don't think I was actually bleeding, I was just bruised around the head for wearing puffy pants. Um, obviously hasn't stopped me though, has it? it? Hasn't put me off. In fact, perhaps it's made me more defiant. Uh, that's my thought for the day. The fashion system distinction. Open University.